apply the intervention ideas that you've already begun to generate uh, within this framework. So the focus today will be to go through the Three Horizons model and how we and you could see it fitting in with your anchor cohort work. And we're also going to introduce you to Karen Perla, who is a strategic consultant that Nourish has been partnering with, and she'll be taking us through the model today. So you'll have a chance at the end to sign up for a one hour coaching session with Karen uh, over the next couple of weeks to look at how this framework and model can actually be applied to the in innovation ideas that you've already begun to generate uh, previously at your place based retreats and the surfacing interventions workshops. Um, and then we'll also have some time today for discussion and a couple of breakouts. So you'll get to roll up your sleeves and play with the model today as well. So we're really looking forward to all of this. Um, and before we dive in, you know, just at a high level, why, why Three Horizons? What is this? Um, why are we holding this webinar today? Karen's going to take us through all of that. But really, we think this is a, a helpful and useful framework for you because it's very adaptive and it's highly future focused. Um, but it helps us examine the present as well to cultivate the desired features that we want. And so we think it's nice um, in recognizing that there's a pressing need for systemic change, but it also holds the truth alongside that, that there are elements here and now that are worth keeping. So as we transition to a more systemic... ...qui va la peine d'être conservé. Donc, euh, on sait qu'il y a des choses que l'on... ...here now that we want to nourish and foster. So we've designed our programming to introduce this now because we feel it's a nice complement to the work that you've been doing with transition design, kind of mapping your problems and setting your visions for the future, working back from there to identify the milestones and interventions that you plan to experiment with um, as we go into the shaping phase of the Nourish Clover. All of that has set things up, we, we hope, really nicely for you to now apply the Three Horizons framework to your cohort activities. So some of the main applications that we see are that we think it can help you quite strategically think about your options and the mix of innovations that you want to experiment with over the coming year. Um, we think it's also potentially an effective communication tool for you to be able to demonstrate to your stakeholders like community partners and patients and senior executive leaders in your health systems, what you're doing and why you think your interventions hold the potential to build different futures. And it can also serve as a guide through the developmental evaluation process, helping you to measure results against what you expected to see. And then the last thing is, is that by developing these three horizon portfolios of innovation, we're calling them, and we'll tell you more about what that means, um, in the month of April, we'll be moving towards unlocking some $10,000 prototyping grants for each anchor cohort team to begin applying toward experimenting uh, with your different ideas. So we see a lot of benefits to this model, and that's why we're really excited to be hosting this webinar today. And with that, I'd like to introduce Karen, who we met through our Developmental Evaluation Advisor, Mark Kabash. I think I saw you on the call, Mark. Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining in spring break. I think you're supposed to be off skiing in the mountains somewhere, but good to see you. Um, and Karen has spent over 15 years actually working in the public sector around integrating innovative ways of working into a wide array of initiatives and disciplines. Um, she's co-founder of the Alberta CoLab, which is the first provincial public sector innovation lab in Canada. And she currently directs the Energy Futures Policy Collaborative for the Energy Futures Lab. So she's a masterful systems thinker, and we're so delighted to be working with you, Karen. So I'll hand it over to you now to share where you're joining from today and take us through the next 90 minutes or so. Welcome. Thank you, Robin. That was awesome. And if you care, my favorite color is also yellow. Um, so I'm just really happy to be here today. It's such a pleasure to meet the larger Nourish team, um, you know, and, and just working with such an ambitious project. You know, it's a project that I feel really is embracing complexity rather than shying away from it. And, and I just love that. Um, I'm what you might call a Three Horizons super fan, uh, <laughs> using it a lot, um, kind of adapting it a lot in a, in a number of different projects, because it's a really simple, intuitive tool for thinking about the future that still has structure and rigor. So to me, it's something that really appeals to both the artist and the CEO and all of us. Um, I definitely have that tension. Every uh, il peut faire appel à la fois à l'artiste et au PDG en chacun de nous. Comme Robin a dit, 
J'ai été directrice de l'initiative Alberta Collab. Nous étions l'une des premières équipes d'innovation sociale du secteur public à être lancée au Canada. Et notre raison d'être... Générer more strategic, more innovative policies and strategies and services. And, you know, applying frameworks like the Three Horizon model was really part of our arsenal um, in that time that we were together. And it was really key for helping leadership really take a step back and really try to understand systems in transition, you know, and then ask themselves, like, so what, now what? So can I get the next slide? So the Three Horizons model is part of a broader field of study focused on the future that we call strategic foresight. And so before I deep dive into the model itself, I often find it's helpful to situate it within that bigger picture because it just gives it uh, the model texture um, as to why you know, there's increasing interest and utility out of it. So foresight, uh, for example, um, I guess if I were to explain it, in is uh, easiest to explain by contrasting it to other approaches for looking at the future, like forecasting. Um, in a, you know, in opposite, as a, I guess, in contrast to for, uh, forecasting, foresight actually isn't trying to predict the future. Uh, rather, foresight really assumes that the future is a highly uncertain space, and that the further you look out, the more uncertain it becomes. In foresight, everything that happens after today is just potential. Um, and the reasons this is important is because despite our best efforts, we as humans and organizations, we tend to find a lot of comfort in the idea that we can predict the future, we can predict things, um, and we have a hard time imagining a world that looks fundamentally different than the one that we're living in today. Um, but that despite how likely we think something will happen, for example, we've still baked in a bunch of assumptions into that idea, and those assumptions would all need to play out for the, those predictions to actually manifest. So, uh, you know, predicting the future is hard. Uh, I spend a lot of time um, in the energy space and, you know, in my world, you only need to look at the organization that we call the International Energy Agency. They are the big F forecasters for us. And you only need to look at their, their reports to see that they've actually never been right. You know, and so a little bit of an irony there because <laughs> forecasting, predicting the future is their bread and butter. Um, that being said, this doesn't mean that we should give up trying to explore the future because refining our understanding of what could happen and what could be possible in the future is really central to understanding how we drive change and where we focus our energy today. So, and part of this is because despite how chaotic things may look in the moment, the future outcomes and how that future eventually evolves can be influenced by the choices and actions that we take today. Can I get the next slide? So just to be clear, you know, I'm not trying to diminish the efforts of those more predictive approaches uh, to the future, but they do have a blind spot in that those approaches tend to predict the future by trying to identify developments and trends um, that already have obvious momentum right now and that we think will persist or just get stronger. Um, and so those approaches are a little bit of a backwards looking exercise. Um, those types of approaches tend to ask, you know, what has happened to date that will likely continue to grow, um, you know, take, for example, the idea that people like cars, you know, it's a, probably a good prediction to assume that more people, more cars will be on the road in the next coming years. I'm being a bit facetious here, but, uh, you know, to continue the driving metaphor, predicting the future that way is almost like driving, but only using your like rear view mirror, or your side view mirror. It assumes that the path ahead is going to look a lot like the path that you're currently on. It's tethered to the idea that things will likely be business as usual for the most part, maybe a couple tweaks here and there. Um, and the problem is that it's really hard to anticipate a bend in the road. What if people actually stop using cars or start using alternative modes of transportation? So foresight gives us what tools um, and ways to basically prioritize things in a future that is inherently very uncertain. And it does so by asking us to embrace the fact that, and, uh, Shelby, can you click that first click? There are no facts about the future. You know, no matter what anyone says, there are no facts. The second principle is that we have to think about multiple alternative futures at the same time, because right now they're all technically possible or plausible. And the third principle is that the seeds of what could create fundamental change and take us off business as usual, off course, are already present today. We just need to figure out where to find them. Can I get the next slide? So, <clears throat> Uh, as time has gone on, foresight has become much more relevant to a number of organizations and change efforts. And that's because uh, fundamentally, we are living in an age of exponential change, where developments right now have a tendency to move from something that feels really deceptively slow to, you know, disruptively quick, uh, fast, faster than we think. 
Uh, I put these up just as examples of what we call exponential developments. Um, take smartphones, for example. It's kind of mind blowing to think that just six years ago, uh, smartphones uh, user, users were about, you know, in six years, smartphone users has doubled in size. And today, almost 80% of the population actually has a smartphone. Um, climate change is another interesting space. In just two years, we've had over 135 countries commit to be climate uh, carbon neutral or net zero. Um, and if you think about where the climate conversation was just five years ago, this is literally mind blowing. Um, on the food side, and a really interesting one is faux meat. You know, basically in the span of the pandemic, faux meat or plant-based alternatives went from something that few people had heard of to something that's actually quite mainstream with most franchises actually offering some of these options. And we call these exponentials because not only did few people predict the scale and speed at which these would evolve, um, these all caused significant disruption to things like power structures, markets, social interactions, the list goes on. Here's the next slide. So the challenge with uncertainty, you know, and how we think about the future is that it makes us feel a little bit hazy about what to do. You know, and while we can probably, we likely can see a couple feet ahead of us uh, with a bit of confidence, the rest feels a bit opaque. So the question Foresight is obsessed with is basically how do we navigate through the fog? Um, and at the end of the day, Strategic Foresight aims to connect these questions about the future in a way that can actually strengthen the innovations that change makers like yourself want to adapt and nourish. You know, as play on words, that's a small joke. Anyways, <clears throat> so traditional planning was more like uh, assuming that the future is like a straight line. You know, here's where we want to go. These are the steps to get there. These are the obstacles we need to get rid of. And boom, that's a nice plan. Um, this kind of linear thinking assumes that change will take decades, you know, not months or years. So, you know, and it may have been a way of planning that worked in the 60s, but I think most of us can agree that ship has definitely sailed. Um, maybe not for Mark. <laughs> uh, I'm aging you a bit. Anyways, um, you know, and at, with COVID, you know, in the moment and the moment that we're living in, it's just such a visceral time to be having these conversations because disruption is happening in real time. Um, COVID has literally become the battlefield of alternative futures. We have seen all sectors, food, health, energy, education, social supports, trying to strategize around the uncertainty caused by COVID. Some are looking to prepare for prolonged change, Others are having a lot of conversations around how do we learn from this experience and how do we build a more resilient initiative or organization to you know, succeed in that next crisis. You know, and COVID has even created a really big window for broader societal conversations that are about, let's not just restart systems, let's think about how we might rethink systems that we know are broken. So from basic universal income to digital aspects digital access as a human right, you know, COVID has confirmed in a lot of ways that everything we thought was impossible actually isn't. So, you know, what you should be really taking away from this is that, you know, preparing for prolonged change, however, is very different than trying to transform a system or transform a situation that we currently find ourselves. And they do require different types of supporting innovations. You can get the next slide. So for example, both of these innovations are looking to deal with flooding and preparing or adapting to some sort of like climate change um, element. On the one hand, you know, you have the view that you can't change certain developments, but you can adapt to them. Hence, houses on stilts. Um, here, again, we're still kind of preparing for change. Um, on the other hand, you have the view that you can actually change things. Hence, the use of locks to allow for more direct routes, more direct access, literally transforming the land base. And in general, and you know, I've, I've said this before, I'll probably get hit by lightning uh, if other people ask, but I do think that uh, in general, the majority of actors and organizations who look at the future really tend to focus on adaptation, adapting to change that they know is likely to come rather than actually driving system uh, change. And this is why the work of change makers like yourself is so distinct when it comes to how we choose to focus a framework like the Three Horizons. Can I get the next slide? So I flag that fact because the Three Horizons framework was actually uh, developed by Bill Sharp of the International Futures Forum, but it was popularized, I would say, uh, for decades by large management, management consulting firms like McKinsey. So to my mind, in its application, it's really leaned towards how might we react to the change um, that we know is coming or take advantage of that change. Um, and so people have tended to confuse it with things like short, medium, and long-term planning, which, you know, to be clear, it is not. Uh, this is fundamentally a tool for change makers to help us not just pause and dream about the future, but look at, you know, make help to us to make sense around like 
trends, emerging changes, help us to assess how bold we feel we can be and the degree to which the current moment is a good window for change. Um, if we as a team can get shared on that, then a tool like Three Horizons, it becomes a platform for helping to generate innovations, you know, that include new products, new policies, new initiatives, new models for uh, connecting, um, that regardless of how ambitious they are, can still be organized as practical steps to a desired future. And it does so by predicting, or, or it does so by depicting um, the future as three overlapping waves of uncertain change that we see from where we're sitting today, um, almost as each wave is a different call to action for a different type of innovation. Can I get the next slide? So without a doubt, you know, any improvement in these messy times, uh, no matter how small, is nonetheless progress. And there's always a sense that focusing on transformative innovation, you know, that world changing stuff, is like placing a really big scary bet. Can you click on that, Shelby, the next click? So, so the reason that Three Horizons is so crucial for change makers, especially in times like this, is that it under, underscores the value of shooting for the stars. And shooting for the stars is a fundamental lens that we need to incorporate into our futures thinking, because you know the premise is that we can't really understand the architecture for systemic change without reimagining the scale of the mission that we're actually all involved with. So you know, and even if we don't quite get there, you know, if we can't get quite to our like uh, goal at the end of the day, it helps pave the way for other change makers coming behind us. Um, and among its many uses, and the reason why Three Horizons is a tool for change makers is because it's also a way to identify transformational change that actually has a chance of succeeding. So these are the bones of the framework. Uh, there's technically a Y and an X axis, where Y is the prevalent um, presence of something in a system, and X is time. Uh, not that they're not useful, but I tend to downplay time only because, you know, we use time not in a literal sense, but in a way to help us unleash our creative thinking, because sometimes to understand potential developments we, uh, that are kind of really disruptive, we tend to have to think in sci-fi terms, you know, something in a future far, far away. So time is a concept, it's not really kind of a predictive element here. Uh, the way the framework works is that everything under a colored line is meant to be a characteristic of that horizon. So here, everything under the pinky orange line is horizon one. Um, and I like to think of each horizon as a different field of play. So for example, horizon one is business as usual. Things under in horizon one look roughly the same as they do today. It's the same game, it's the same rules. Innovations focused here basically are intended to strengthen what we currently do, what we're currently good at. We are focusing on our core purpose, doing more of what we currently do by doing it faster, better, cheaper, et cetera. Um, and those types of innovations are really good, but they tend to be tweaks to the system. Um, plastics is a good example. In Canada, we've always had some sort of recycling program as a way to deal with the waste problem. Um, a tweak to this came in when we started to pay people five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents to bring in their bottles, trying to nudge more participation. Inevitably, as we've talked about, business as usual becomes less fit for purpose. And so this horizon is also currently, if we think about it, in decline. It contains the things that may not be relevant going forward. Um, and so in what is disrupting horizon one is horizon two. Everything under the yellow line here in this visual is horizon two. Horizon 2 is characterized by what is most likely going to create and probably already create change in business as usual. Those things that are making business as usual less relevant. Here, the game is the same for the most part, but the rules are starting to change. H2 is the horizon of disruption. Um, innovation here is a very visible change, but it's not something fundamentally different. This means that innovations here are likely focused on something that you know, are adjacent to what we currently do. Um, going back to the recycling example, a big disruption, if you're in that space, could be innovations around biodegradable plastics. You know, we're really looking to use different materials, which really changes the nature of what we do and the nature of the problem that we need to solve. Everything under the blue line is Horizon 3. This is the future we want. Horizon 3 is a future where the weakest seeds of change that we see today have now started to take root and they've actually started to flourish. And the beautiful part, of course, is that the seeds of what are possible should be already part of Horizon 1. Um, going back to the plastics example, 
Uh, this feature would see things like circular plastic scale, unlocking something that turns our linear use models on their head. You know, in a world of plastics, this would be something that, you know, it would be completely new to not only to organizations, but to cities, to the sector, et cetera. It's a totally different game governed by a whole different set of rules. And as change makers, we want these transformative seeds to grow. Can I get the next slide? So before we plot your innovations or even generate new innovations and priorities, I always think it's a good idea to map or describe each horizon in more detail. Um, that is very specific to the context that you find yourself in or the question that you find yourself focusing on. Um, and you can do this in a number of different ways. You can identify the issues and or opportunities that characterize a specific horizon or the dominant emerging practices or trends that essentially form the patterns of change um, in each horizon. Or you can even use assets, you know, things that you either have access to or could have access to that provide you value. Um, I highly recommend doing this uh, before overlaying initiatives and projects. Uh, because it's a nice way to test our assumptions as a group, you know, um, expand our sense of what is possible because, you know, we do this as a, as a group exercise, as a conversation, and so we're constantly building on each other's ideas and perspectives. And what's great is that I believe today we're really going to try to give you some time to actually take a first cut of what that could look like. Next slide. But before I do, I wanted to share a few examples of what this can look like. Um, basically, what you should take from this is that mapping is messy. Um, and it, look, it can look very different, and that is totally okay. Um, the point is that we're doing it together and embracing the idea that change is truly possible. This one was developed with a local uh, education authority in Scotland to, uh, that was transitioning to the uh, curriculum of excellence. It's a great example that uses a mix of perspectives uh, in terms of the practices and the issues that they're dealing with to define each horizon. Uh, and it includes a consideration of tensions. And you have, to, you have to look really close, but you know, there's a tension here identified in terms of like quality of life versus material gain was a tension they were already experiencing in Horizon 1. Um, the black boxes are really just the cues that were used to facilitate the conversation, but it's a nice little like neat kind of example of what this can look like. Can I get the next one? This one was created for Alberta's energy sector with the help of yours truly. Uh, moi. This one was developed by the executive teams in the department and identified really specific issues that Alberta, the province, would be facing as a producer and exporter of oil, uh, depending on which horizon it was focused on. This was later used to do a deeper dive where uh, uh, the executive team basically prioritized the issues that they actually cared about before identifying responding innovations. <clears throat> Can I get the next slide? Probably not your favorite example, but I think it's interesting. Mark Zuckerberg unveiled Facebook's 10-year roadmap during the F8 conference in 2016, which looked oddly like the Three Horizon model. Don't overthink this example. I like to show it because it shows an application of the model using assets. Um, Horizon 1 is about nurturing the core uh, Facebook ecosystem. Horizon 2 is about extending the core ecosystem and accelerating and growing their recent acquisitions like Instagram and WhatsApp. And Horizon 3 is more ambitious and it's really looking at, you know, implementing new technologies that show how, you know, uh, into how they can like actually grow their like service. So I like it because it also shows that, you know, horizons change and they can change quickly. Uh, this was, was mapped out in 2016, but if you think about where VR and AI are today, even drone technology, um, you can see that actually moving into Horizon 2, albeit slowly, but, you know, it's a very dynamic model in terms of how we think uh, the future is kind of evolving. So before we break you up into your small group exercises, um, I'm going to hand it over to Mayor to introduce kind of some really interesting linkages with the Three Horizons model and uh, two I'd seen. Thanks, Karen. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, what I wanted to share today was I see systems work or systems change having ways of doing. So to me, a lot of the work that we do at Nourish seems like it has always been done this way, or it's just a natural way to do things, um, kind of makes sense. So as part of the anchor cohort, we are joining together to address uh, wicked problems, to better the planet and people that are living on the planet. And one way that we're doing this is through the Three Horizons framework. So when I heard Karen share these slides for the first time, I automatically envisioned this through a two-eyed uh, seeing way. And we had this beautiful short film created to share with you before your breakout session. So 
Um, unfortunately, it won't be translated right now, but um, if you have questions in your breakout session, I think Peter can help you out. When I look at the Three Horizons framework, my two-eyed seeing brings to mind a braid of sweetgrass, its strands woven together to create a stronger braid that cannot easily be broken. And a braid of sweetgrass cannot be woven alone. Someone needs to hold one end. Someone needs to braid. And when left unbraided, a strand can easily be broken. Similarly, we cannot change our broken system without leaders like you braiding different ways of doing for a more viable future. The Three Horizons model has three important levels. Same game, same rules. Same game, new rules. New game, new rules. Similar to a braid, there are three important elements, body, mind, and spirit, that need to be woven together. All elements or interventions, the strands of a braid, are deeply intertwined. They are stronger together than when they are separate, and each is essential and stronger when braided together. Back to me. <laughs> okay. I love that. Um, I just, I love the fact that that kind of connection just emerged in our first conversation with Mayor. Um, so, you know, now that you've seen the model um, at a very high level, and then you've also seen this video to hopefully spark some additional thinking around how all these different horizons actually work together, we want to break you up into groups to actually map out, at least try us to start that conversation around the nourished version of the three horizons model. Each group um, will actually tackle a different horizon. Um, so before I unleash you into these groups, I just want to go through each horizon one more time to just queue up the conversation that we'd like you to have in your small groups. So uh, here are some of the key questions. Um, if you're in the first group, you are in horizon one. This is business as usual. So the conversation we want you to have are things like, you know, what are the key characteristics of the prevailing system? What trends, cultures, laws, anything has led to this current system? What needs to drop? for change to actually start to emerge. Is there anything about the system that we would want to retain, keep, because it's important and valuable rather than lose? Next slide. Horizon two, if you're group two, you are in the group that's looking at disruption and you will be exploring, um, you know, basically what is being disrupted? What are emerging trends that we are starting to really take notice of? Which assumptions um, that we do we have that will likely be most challenged by these disruptions? what are the most vulnerable things right now and you know what are things that are being strengthened etc can i get the next slide okay and finally group three we'll be exploring the landscape for transformation by looking and identifying you know what are the weak signals present today um, that are actually really kind of sparking the conversation around new paradigms what is the future we want to create and how does uh this align to that future you know are there any competing futures when we think about that future and, and you know, given our work and given the question that we're tackling. Um, and do we want to kind of be aware of that and name that? So that's basically it. It shouldn't be too hard. We're gonna to try to give you around 30 minutes in the group because, before we bring you back. And each group will have a facilitator. Um, the ask when you come back is that each group basically share kind of their biggest takeaways from the conversation. And we're gonna ask that someone in the group kind of volunteer to provide that share back, okay? Any additional guidance before we break out, Robin? No, I'm just wondering if we should allow a moment to see if there's any questions that would be relevant for everyone to hear before we um, put you into the group. So I just wanted to give space for that if there's any questions. Does that sound okay for everyone? We do have different facilitators in each of the groups too, so you'll have someone there with you. Don't see any hands up or any questions in the chat. Good. Okay. So we'll send you off then now. And I'm going to put the Miro board link. Before we debrief Karen, I just wanted to mention that people might need to select their language again coming back from the breakout. So if you need to do that, hopefully you can hear me and you're on the English or French channel and you can hear Peter's interpretation, but just a reminder on that. Okay. Yeah, so we'll we'll um we'll brief back just very quickly. 
We'll take three minutes if you need it per group, but basically all we want to hear is your biggest takeaways from the conversation. Um, so I'm going to let's go with group one. Like, what does business as usual look like right now? Where's group one? Hi, uh, my name is Vincent. I'm happy to kick our group's sharings off. We had um, play some good discussion around both the health system and the food system. We kind of went between the two of them. Um, talk about how it's, it's a globalized system, it's very capitalist, a focus on individual needs, how certain goals in the healthcare system seem good, like a zero harm policy, but that that actually leads to unintentional consequences. Um, and then we, we went into, well, what, what do we want to keep and what do we want to drop? Um, and we, we found that in a lot of the things that we wanted to drop, there was an element that we wanted to keep. So for example, we might the zero harm targets might be unrealistic and therefore cause problems, but the desire to reduce harm in healthcare could be a positive thing. Or the industrial nature of food systems could be problematic because of the toll on social and environmental health. But on the other hand, the desire to do to, to we, we kind of went back and forth with the idea of efficiencies could be positive. Um, and then that led into a whole discussion around, well, efficient, what kind of efficiencies, at what cost? Um, so that was kind of where we, we left the conversation. That is awesome. I really like the different kind of nuances that you kind of brought to what business as usual looks like, and especially the unintended consequences of even like those small, small pieces. Um, okay, so group number two, what were your biggest takeaways? This is the horizon of disruption. What is driving change right now? Hi, um, and <clears throat> I mentioned from the team, feel free to jump in if I'm missing some um, missing some aspects. Um, so some of the things that we've discussed uh, have become a lot more visible in the last few years, especially in the context of the uh, the pandemic. So things that we've seen are like rising cost of food and supply chains is being challenged, some slow local food movements that are growing, some increased representation of voices. Um, and traditional food and healthcare as a setting of colonial resistance. And we've been able to kind of map this through into how some of these assumptions are being challenged and on, on the ground, how some of these changes are, are happening. And while I think the, the biggest takeaway was that while this doesn't completely change the, the rules of the game, it does, uh, it does make for some like easier to achieve changes at the moment. Um, so some things that we were seeing were shift in procurement practices that will actually divert food away from other countries and actually favor local settings in healthcare, um, shift to income-based support, so it would increase agency for, um, uh, for people rather than uh, pre-made baskets for, for, food and, for food and security and increased reliance on farmers market as well as government deferring decisions about sustainable management uh, to indigenous peoples. So some, some progress on that front. I really, really like that. Um, and I like the, you know, how both of those horizons are like almost happening at the same time right now. Definitely, you know, you're seeing business as usual trying to recover, but that drive for change just like is undeniable. So that was an awesome report back. And then to my group, <laughs> can we share our biggest takeaways from the conversation? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Shaquille. Um, so our group, we really uh, started off by looking at the different weak signals that were showing for possible changes in a new game. And it was actually pretty surprising to see how many weak signals COVID has opened up. A lot of different policy conversations have opened up about like food as a right, basic income, uh, self-sufficiency of our food systems and our health systems, and even things like circular food economies. Um, we then started moving on to then talking about the tensions that might be brought up as we go towards this new future with this new game. So we talked about the ideas of land back, but how that might create tension with things like multiple land uses for agriculture. So if we want to have more local agriculture, how does that conflict with our want to also have land back or also how do we make sure the correct voices are at the table and we have the intergenerational voices there and take into account our indigenous knowledge that has been there all along and may help us deal with not only the climate crisis, but also our food systems and our health systems as well. That was so good. I can't believe you made me give you a virtual cup of coffee to like volunteer to report that. Oh, that is awesome. You know, and like 
what will be exceptionally awesome is when you can see how all of these kind of weave together once we bring bring the three different horizons into one visual. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, you know, this was a high level kind of quick cut at trying to map the three horizons from a nourish perspective. Um, but then let's talk about like the innovations that you guys are actually all exploring. So, you know, now that we have a sense of the model, you know, and what can distinguish change that is incremental from potential change that is transformative, you know, the question is like, where does Nourish want to focus its time and effort and people? So, you know, this, what you see on the screen is a work in progress, but it basically is trying to emphasize that social innovators, to my mind, need to focus or at least consider at least five dimensions of potential in terms of what they're thinking could be a good action or innovation. And, you know, because all of these have implications in terms of, you know, how you see your role as a change maker um, and your willingness and ability to pursue uh, an idea as an initiative or an innovation. So, you know, and the five dimensions are you want to, you know, in terms of an idea, you want to understand its potential for impact, you know, the extent to which an innovation can make a positive difference on a complex social challenge, you know, its feasibility. You know, the extent to which an innovation can be implemented with existing capabilities or do we require new capabilities. Um, it's viability, the extent to which an innovation um, can be supported by the larger system of institutions, policies and, and power structures. Risk, you know, is a big one, the extent to which an innovation is likely to experience failure or unintended consequences and resistance, you know, like the extent to which the bigger systems system actors are potentially uh, rejected. So if I can get the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so I just want, I feel it's like really just helpful to then just go back to the three horizons that we've, you know, now mapped and just talk about what this looks like in terms of those kind of five dimensions. So if we take horizon one, horizon one innovations, as we've talked about, would be those that deliver incremental change to the system. Uh, we like these, actually, we like them a lot because they have a high likelihood of being realized um, because they don't really rock the boat, right? Um, you're not going to get a lot of resistance if you're going to focus uh, in some ideas on Horizon 1. Um, if you're doing what you're currently doing and people see what you're doing is valuable, uh, you're also not going to get a lot of resistance from this. Um, these types of innovations, again, I want to underscore are important because they are relevant to the day, to the moment, and they create momentum. For what, uh, for what, for your value right now. Um, but if you just focus here, uh, the change that you're trying to ultimately drive um, may be too little, too late, which is kind of its limitation. Horizon two is about trying to disrupt things. Um, so innovations here, we say they are reform oriented. It, it is a powerful type of innovation um, that may still experience some resistance uh, from actors in the system or the broader community because the full outcome of these ideas can never be fully known. You know, we're seeing uh, challenges or like uh, shifts in supply chains. Maybe there's an idea that we can harness there, but we don't fully know like if it'll work out and what the uh, impacts will be. Um, that said, you know, we know this is a place that's opening up. It's a good bet. And oftentimes innovations focused here are key to correcting shortcomings in terms of how things currently run. Um, again, they may bring some unintended consequences and people tend to be a little bit adverse, adverse to that. They may also create some conflict because they may start to change power systems or threaten the role, traditional roles of certain actors, decision makers. We talked a lot of in, in, our, in our group around like who needs to be at the table, for example. Um, and at the same time, they may empower others, which may be really important to like think about. Uh, Horizon 3 is really about transforming or reimagining the world as we know it today. Innovations here are really truly radical and visionary, and which means the resistance to them will probably be really stubborn. Um, and even if we thought we've thoroughly examined this idea, we feel it's a great concept, the risk of unintended consequences will always be high with, with these types of innovations. Um, in my world, for example, uh, electrical vehicles are still likely a Horizon 3 idea. They haven't like penetrated the market fully just yet. But one concern is that, you know, right now we're dealing with an oil cartel. Maybe we're going to switch that to then become mineral cartels because we need to have those batteries. Uh, regardless, these are moonshots that are often critical for creating fundamental change, right? And so just because it seems hard to do or it seems like we're going to get some resistance, they are still critical and important for us to think about. Um, and we've talked about this time and time again, but I think it bears saying, you know, in moments of crisis like the one we're experiencing right now, 
um, what seems like an impossible solution or a solution in waiting, all of a sudden has a surge of potential behind it. You've got this wave, you know, you've got this like tailwind kind of pushing you forward. Um, think about that awesome saying, never waste a crisis. This is kind of the moment that we're in because uh, a crisis as hard as it is to live through opens up that window for change. Um, and the chaos and realities of COVID have really created a moment for some really amazing conversations. You know, one that I've recently been thinking about a lot was there's policy and programming now starting to take root around the idea of universal mental health care. You know, um, for most of us before COVID, mental health was something that you had to pay for, you know, so not everyone could have access to, but the idea of like equity for mental health was something, you know, is something that people are now actually starting to talk about. And it's not probably going to go away anytime soon. So can I get the next slide? Okay, so what, Karen? So the key takeaway from this is that to create change, we need to be thinking, you know, when we think about the future, we need to be thinking about all of these horizons, all three horizons at the same time. And we need to be comfortable, you know, in terms of our own level of ambition, this represents for our organizations. So, uh, you know, that's why the output of applying a three horizons model is often a portfolio of innovations, a portfolio of experiments, some, we, we also say that's another name that we call it because there's no silver bullet for um, for dealing with complex challenges or trying to uh, create systems change. Um, but supporting multiple actions often creates interconnected impact that offers us better odds for creating that desired change and in theory actually helps us spread the risk um, of these types of ideas for change makers. Um, it's about you know like creating a portfolio is really about taking a step back and seeing where our innovations currently land you know, what our allies are doing, asking ourselves what kind of change maker we actually wanna be, and potentially then upgrading our portfolio if these things don't actually square with each other. Um, and these are great conversations to have because, you know, I think in addition to help create cohesion as a team, you're like, what do we actually need to kind of get this off the ground? Um, so I can get the last slide. So I just wanna like cap off with this concept. Basically, you know, like we've mapped the landscape. Once you overlay your innovations, um, it's again important to take a step back and ask, what does this mean in terms of how we see the future and our role in it? Um, for example, if you feel your value is really in continuing to do what you do and you know, your resources should really be prioritized doing that, um, again, which is important and critical, we need change makers focus on the core, um, you could be an optimizer. You're really just trying to make what you do better. <clears throat> if you want to play in all the three different spaces of innovation highlighted by the model, um, because you want to learn and you want to expand your ambition, uh, you likely want to create a more balanced portfolio um, to see what that could look like as a spread for your organization. And you know what's great about this, we say that you're basically a robust innovator, is that you always have something in the works, you know, something that's ready to take off when the window is right, when the timing is right. If you are like, I just want to tip a dip a toe into something different, something new for us. Um, some we're kind of kind of looking into that disruptive space, you know, kind of edging out into a new area for us. Then you might be more entrepreneurial in how you kind of look at innovation, um, which is good because you're basically trying to build momentum around, you know, what's new and emerging in in your world. Or you're maybe you're into big bets. You know, you want to orient the majority of your focus, time, people, and energy towards transformational change. Your portfolio could look like the one on the far hand side. You know, you just want to protect the core a little bit, but focus all of your juice on that transformation. So you are a shaper. You are fully in on trying to shape the future of the work that you're doing. Um, and to my mind, this is an important piece again, because uh, it really is important to talk about the implications of how you're landing your innovations, the talents and capacities you need, what kind of funding you would need to target, you know, again, new allies, new partnerships that you need to kind of like elevate what you're doing. And at the end of the day, you've built something that you can continue to go back and revisit and seeing how is this working, right? How are our innovations landing? Do we need to adjust them, et cetera? So it's just a great way to think about like, how do we actually take innovation from being a really great concept to being something that we're actually doing in our everyday. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Robin. Cool. Thanks, Karen. Um, well, this is really, really interesting. And I imagine people are probably seeing um, Shelby. So can you just jump to the next slide for me for a sec? Yeah, perfect. Um, lots of parallels with what we've been talking about in the first year of the cohort and where this might apply. 
So now that you've had a chance to kind of get to know the model a little bit more, discuss some of the trends and patterns that you see, the next step that we want to take you through will be to apply your own intervention ideas to the Three Horizons model itself. So what we're moving towards is creating your own team-based portfolios of innovation that reflect what you want to prototype and experiment with in the coming months and year ahead. So in the shaping phase of the Clover in our anchor cohort model. So those portfolios might look something like this. And this version was actually produced from examples um, from all seven of the anchor cohort teams and the interventions that you began to identify in the surfacing interventions workshops at your place-based retreat. So each team came up with anywhere from like 15 to 50 different ideas through that process. And now it's gonna be tricky, but I think you can do it. The job will be to start to think about how you want to hone in on the first set of interventions that you'll prototype as part of the process moving into this next phase of work. And so it's not to say that you'll be disregarding those other intervention ideas, but we hope that the Three Horizons model will help you think about identifying a mix of innovations, perhaps some that fall under each of the horizons, or as the slide that um, Karen just shared, you know, you might skew a little bit more heavily to horizon one, two, or three, which is also fine. So there's no better or worse scenario here, but we do think that these maps will be helpful to you in crystallizing which ideas you want to start with. Um, but also making sure that you're thinking about your interventions in an integrated way where they can complement each other. And so if we go back to transition design and think about what we learned from Terry and Gideon, for instance, we know that the complexity of these wicked problems requires a suite of interventions to be able to address them effectively. We can't just focus on one project or one initiative. It won't be able to capture and respond to the complexity of the issues that we're working with. So that's why we really feel that this Three Horizons picture fits so nicely with what we've learned through transition design, because we think it can help you hone in on this portfolio that will really give you some clarity for where you start with and what you focus on um, with these mix of different prototyping options that you have over the next little while. Okay. So um, the next slide, Shelby, just shows a version of this that is blank. And We'll share this with you. I think we've actually um, got the link that we can put in the chat here today. And what we encourage you to do is download a copy of that in your Teams, an editable version that you can begin to work with. And you'll be able to start thinking about your particular wicked problem, your particular set of interventions that you've already generated ideas for to be able to begin to build your own portfolios of innovation. So each team will, over the next month or so, be moving towards an established portfolio where you're aiming from anywhere between probably five and 10. Um, it's not rigid or strict, but that's kind of what we have in mind in terms of what might make sense as a starting point. Um, and think about what kinds of transformation you're looking to achieve. So are you the entrepreneur? Are you a robust innovator? Are you one of the shapers? What does your team want to embody and really kind of invest in over the next while with the interventions that you're going to be working on? So that's kind of our plan and, and why we wanted to introduce Three Horizons at this point. So Shelby, if you can go back just two slides, I think it was to the road ahead. Yeah, perfect. I'll just kind of summarize what's coming up next between now and the summer gatherings that we've scheduled for uh, this summer, June, July, and August. Okay, so after today, we invite you to book a coaching session with Karen. So you will be able to have your team meet with Karen one-on-one -on -one to start to look at your specific intervention ideas, what you've already got, um, and maybe you wanna add to those to begin to build your own portfolios of innovation. So there's a sign up form that Rachel has also put in the chat. Thanks, Rachel. Um, to, for you to fill in a time and date that works for your team to meet with Karen. We're asking that you fill that in by April 6th. Um, most of the options are for the following week in mid-April. So set up a time with Karen, really take advantage of that opportunity to go a bit deeper on your own team's ideas and thinking. 
Um, and then you, you can also start to kind of populate that template ahead of time if you want. You can kind of bring that with any questions to Karen in, in that conversation, or you can be, begin to build it together. I think that's really up to you, but you've got the template there as an option. And uh, Karen is a great resource, uh, I think, similar to what we did with those tutorial sessions with Terry and Gideon following the transition design workshops. We've set up some time for you to be able to work more closely with Karen around developing your portfolios. And then we're asking you to submit those completed portfolio maps to us by April 25th. And that's all that will be required to unlock the $10,000 grants from Nourish that we're going to make available to you for starting your prototyping. Um, and that's just really to kick things off. And we hope that they will be useful to you in catalyzing some ideas that you have, getting going, tapping into a bit of funding where you might need it to bring some of those ideas to life. And then um, we'll have a follow-up webinar on May 5th, where we'll get a chance to hear from you about your portfolios. So you'll have a chance for um, all of the teams to be able to share what you're gonna be focusing on in the months ahead, um, which I think will be really exciting because I know this is something that you've all been waiting to see and wanting to hear about uh, in terms of what each other's working on and where your priorities are in response to the wicked problems because a lot of the problems in the cohort are similar and related and they touch on some, some similar issues, right? So that's why we've um, built it this way and that that will kind of lead nicely into the three gatherings that we have on for this summer. And so with the first one in Montreal being focused on food security, you know, we'll be extracting some of the interventions from these portfolios that are more related to food security, for instance. And then likewise, in Vancouver, we'll be looking more at some of the climate and planetary health related interventions that have come out through these portfolios. And then with August in Thunder Bay, we've got a thematic focus for that gathering around food sovereignty. So similarly, what we think we'll be able to see as you all develop your portfolios is um, some patterns that, that will emerge. We expect around those themes just based on what we've heard from you already, but obviously um, your interventions won't be exclusively dedicated to those necessarily either because you're gonna be developing a mix. So that's kind of where we're headed. And we did wanna make sure that we allowed a few minutes today just for general discussion and any questions, um, whether it be about the model itself and the theoretical framework of Three Horizons, whether it be about practicalities of what's next and, and what you're doing with the cohort. So we've got, it looks like about seven minutes before we wrap uh, to hear back from you about anything that you want to discuss. So a little bit of open time for us on this call. Karen, did you wanna add anything before we? open it up. Uh, just that I think, you know, um, to spark or to continue what we built today, um, it, we're happy to clean that up and share that with the teams so they can start like overlaying their innovations on top of that. For sure. Yeah. So that Miro board link um, will remain open and accessible. And if you were, you know, obviously we were all only in one group. So if you want to check out some of what the other groups are talking about, it's probably really helpful in providing a basis for some of the thinking that you might do around your specific portfolios. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. So how does that feel? What do people think of this framework? Uh, I find it really exciting, but I'm curious to know how it's landed with you today and if you can see applications to the work that we've been doing. Any questions that have come up for you? Don't be shy, you can use the chat or just unmute yourself and speak up. See your names, so I know you're still with us. FYI folks, uh, coaching sign up forms aren't open yet. Oh, okay. We'll just uh, make that fully editable. Thanks, Josh, for letting us know. Charlotte, can we get it in another way? Are you talking about the sign up form? Yeah, Google Docs doesn't work great for us at work. Okay, sure. Um, why don't I just, we can send you the times and then you can let us know which one works best for you. Thank you. Yeah. Penny. Hi, Robin. Um, it's Sonia here uh, from Vancouver. Um, I um, can just share that I feel that the process today was really helpful in sort of strengthening my understanding of what we've done so far. 
Um, so it feels like it was a moment to pause and, and get a little bit more clarity um, and just a stronger understanding. And also to hear from others, right? Because we've been talking about it in our own cohorts, but to hear from other cohorts as well was helpful. And um, yeah, so it was a really lovely way to sort of uh, consolidate my learning so far. Well, it's good to hear. Thanks for sharing that, Sonia. Yeah, we did extend the timing of this webinar by 30 minutes because we wanted to allow a little bit more time to connect with each other. And so I know there's trade-offs there, but it's often hard to get that in in an hour-long session. And so I appreciate everyone sticking around for the 90 minutes today. Um, but yeah, I think it had a lot of benefits in that you got to connect in those breakout conversations and chat with some other people in the cohort too. Annie, sorry, go ahead. No problem at all. I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for, for the presentation. That was really inspiring and, and brought a lot of a lot of different perspectives. And I'm, I all echo some of his comments. I'm really glad we had a chance to discuss this outside of our core group um, because it really brought different perspectives and different ideas that we hadn't necessarily thought about. We hadn't necessarily thought that we're in the same in the same horizon. So I'm just really looking forward to going back to the drawing board with the team and working on that further. So huge thanks. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that comment, Annie. Appreciate having you here and your voice in the conversation. Thanks, Shelby. Yeah, I think we're probably done with the slides. That's perfect. A couple more minutes still. Go ahead. Can I share one? Um, I just want to do a shout out to Mayor. I just, I don't know, I'm still like reflecting on the connections between the Three Horizons and braiding. Um, and I actually think that there's a lot in there that Nourish is doing that no one else is doing that we can actually offer up as a learning to other people looking to apply Three Horizons. So that is really exciting for me. So thank you for that, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I was really excited that uh, you guys were so open to, to hearing that and having the animation done too. It's really nice. Yeah, it was really great. We were having a conversation in our team a few weeks ago about the Three Horizons and Mara's like, this is what's coming up for me. What do you guys think of this? Like I'm applying this different lens to it. And it's, I think it's something we're always trying to do with the cohort work and at Nourish internally too, is to be thinking about understanding these models in different ways. But um, Myra like really amazingly pulled together <laughs> this animation with a partner. Um, and so we really appreciate having that video. And I put the link in the chat there too, in case anybody wants to watch it again or share it um, with any others. It's available on our YouTube right now. Um, that's on Vimeo right now because it was quite a quick turnaround, but I'll put it on um, YouTube today and share it out again. I'll also put it on our website. Um, yeah, so we'll put so all of this, con thank you for raising that too, we'll have this content on the internal cohort page, so you can go back and access everything, the video, the slides, sign up form, um, the blank template, it'll all be uh, contained on a web page for you, so we'll send some follow up after the webinar with the recording and um, the connection to that content for you too, so you'll get that in your email. Great. Well, Karen, I think we had a sign off thing. Do you want to just uh, throw that out to the group? I do. Um, I always think it's important to close together. Um, so a question, and I'm happy for you to take, throw it in the chat box or even like say it out loud. I'm just curious. Um, you've had a lot of information thrown at you, but we've also had a lot of good discussion. Um, and I'm feeling really excited about getting to know the courts one on one. Um, but the question is, like, what is most alive for you as you leave today's session? And it could be about the model, but it also could be about the world in general or the possibility of change, whatever you want and just put it in the chat box or throw it out there. But what are you leading with in your head? One thought. That's perfect. And then uh, feel free to go ahead and, and sign off. We'll end on time today. I feel like we we deserve like extra, I don't know. I didn't <laughs> really end on time. time. <laughs> So thank you so much, Karen. Really appreciate you joining this. And I think from what I'm seeing and hearing, people are really excited for those uh, follow-up conversations with you. So thank you so much for this. I think it's given us so much to think about and um, lots of synergies with the work that's happening in the cohort today. So many thanks to you.